As Arwa just said, this is an extremely complicated multidimensional conflict that we are witnessing, but President Trump considers this fight between Turkey and Kurdish-led forces to be more black and white. Sometimes you have to let him fight a little while. Then people find out how tough the fighting is. These guys know right up here. These guys know. Right? Sometimes you have to let them fight. It's like two kids in a lot. You got to let them fight, and then you pull them apart. But let's take a look at the numbers in what President Trump is describing as a schoolyard fight. Back in January of 2018, the U.S. announced it was going to train about 15,000 Syrian Kurdish fighters to be part of a 30,000-strong border force in the country's north. Just compare that to Turkey's estimated 730,000 troops, the second-largest standing army force in NATO. And it has really been a gut-wrenching week. For many U.S. forces who have fought alongside the mostly Kurdish Syrian Democratic forces in northern Syria and now feel like they are abandoning their brothers and sisters in arms, it's been hard for the families, too. One U.S. military spouse has written an open letter to the Kurds, and CNN is protecting her identity because her spouse is still active duty. In it, she writes this, Dear Kurdish soldiers, you don't know me, but I have known of you most of my adult life. When my military husband and I quickly married, knowing he was deploying to the Middle East to be part of the 2003 invasion of Iraq, I feared what he and his special operations unit would face when they arrived. How bad would the fighting be? How long would they be gone? Would he survive? And months later, he returned and recounted to me what he could about his experience, and I asked how he had made it through. He replied, we had help. We had the Kurds. He told me stories of how the Kurdish people in northern Iraq supported the troops, advised them, stood by them, fought shoulder to shoulder with them in combat, and became an ally and a friend. And I became grateful, immensely, unwaveringly, and forever grateful for you. Since then, the word Kurds in my home has meant something. It has meant ally and friendship. There are pictures of Iraqi Kurds alongside my husband and fellow soldiers in our home. I have a coffee mug with depictions of female Syrian Kurdish soldiers on it that I proudly use to remind me of you. My children play soccer in their Kurdistan jerseys. The Kurdish people are not nameless, faceless people across the world. You hold a place of honor and respect in our home. It's important to me that all of you know that. I owe you so much. My husband is home, safe today after years of fighting, and I know you helped make that happen. But now I watch the news in horror. I see promises broken, progress destroyed, years of hard work and unimaginable, uh, unimaginable sacrifice gone in a tweet. I see allies betrayed, their faces in my picture frame. While watching the news, my children ask, my children turn to me and ask if those are our friends, and I say yes. They have looks of confusion on their faces. I can't imagine what your families are going through. I can't imagine their fear. I can't imagine these things because for the last 17 years, you have fought to help us keep an attack off our soil, and I know that has now compromised your safety. It breaks my heart, she says. And she goes on to say, I write you today on behalf of my family to say thank you for everything you have done for us. Thank you for your friendship, for keeping your word and fighting alongside us, for staying the course year after year. Thank you for keeping my husband safe so he could come back home to me and my children. You have my sincerest th uh, prayers today that you too may safely return to yours. Thank you to your families that sacrifice without you so you can make this partnership happen. I pray we return to your side, that we stand by you, and this has not all been in vain. Forever yours a grateful wife. And that is just part of what this military spouse wrote here. You can read her entire letter at CNN.com slash opinion. Let's talk all of this over now with CNN political analyst and Washington Post columnist Josh Rogan with us, as well as retired Air Force Colonel Cedric Layton. He is also a CNN military analyst. So whether you have this ceasefire that is holding, and I know even <laughs> there are many analysts who take issue with the idea of this being a ceasefire, right? The Turks see this uh, as a pause. Let's listen to what the president said last hour. I just spoke to President Erdogan of Turkey. We're doing very, very well with Turkey. Uh, there's a ceasefire or a, a pause or whatever you want to call it. Uh, there was some sniper fire this morning. There was mortar fire this morning that was eliminated quickly. And uh, they're back to the full pause. Uh, should the president be so easily placated by Erdogan? He really seems to be quite convinced that what he's saying is the gospel. 
Yeah, he shouldn't be. This is, you know, this is very typical of someone like Erdogan. Uh, he's, in essence, running the information war in, in this campaign. And he's doing it, uh, and his main victim, and his main, uh, really the main target of his operation, is President Trump. President Trump, for whatever reason, believes that whatever Erdogan says is the gospel. It is not the gospel. It is absolutely, fundamentally untrue, and it needs to be verified by the intelligence agencies, agencies that President Trump, of course, doesn't like. Yep. That's a very good point, Cedric. Um, so, Josh, in, in this op-ed that you wrote in the Washington Post, this is about the withdrawal from nor northern Syria. You say, and for years to come, the world will be dealing with the consequences, including more terrorism, more refugees, more Iranian expansion, more war crimes, more Russian influence, and a grim future for millions of innocent Syrians. Uh, the president, though, he characterizes this as he's saving the lives of U.S. service members. Right. Well, we have to understand what the ceasefire is. It's a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound, okay, a self-inflicted gunshot wound at that. And even if it works the way it's supposed to, which is a big if, that totally ignores the underlying larger problem, which is that President Trump has made another decision to withdraw all 1,000 U.S. troops from northern Syria. We're blowing up our bases. I would ref defer to Cedric on this, but in, typically in military operations, if you're blowing up your own bases, you're doing it wrong, okay? Yeah. And what we've done Are is... You, they're doing it wrong, Not Cedric. only handed That's over... That's not how it's supposed to work. Exactly. No, it's, it's not how it's supposed to work, and Josh is exactly right. You're pointing out all the right things here, because from a strategic standpoint, you know, if you're blowing up your own bases, you're losing ground, you are vacating territory, you are ceding that territory either to an enemy or to somebody else. Well, and specifically in this case, we're going to cede it to the Assad regime and Iran and Russia, okay? And what that spells is suffering for years for millions of innocent Syrians. There are a lot of outrage about the Kurds, and rightly so, but there are mostly Sunni Arab people living in not the border zone. The border zone is just up here. The rest of that territory that the Assad regime will take over are innocent Syrians who have been resisting Assad's rule for nine years. Now they face a grim future, and you can be sure that the Assad regime and Iran will make them pay, and it will be partially our fault. And what does it also mean for U.S. service members if the U.S., whether it's, it seems unlikely it's this administration, but potentially a, a future administration, makes a calculation that the U.S. somehow needs to be involved and maybe they don't have the benefit of a light footprint approach with an ally who's bearing the brunt of casualties. What then does it mean for U.S. forces, Cedric? It means, uh, Brianna, that we're going to have to go in with a much heavier footprint. The risk to our forces is going to be much, much greater than it otherwise would have been. And it's also going to mean it's going to be much harder to do. Uh, just from a pure military and political standpoint, it is going to be a very difficult operation to undergo. And I think, you know, Josh would probably agree with me that uh, if we decide to go back in there, it's not only going to be tougher, but it's going to take a lot longer. I, I think one fundamental thing that Trump gets wrong, and he gets a lot of stuff wrong, is the idea that Russia and Assad and Iran are going to fight ISIS, okay? For years, the Assad regime has used terrorists to intimidate the West and also to uh, put, put, portray the Syrian conflict as a false choice between him and ISIS. That's what he does. That's what he's going to do. The terrorism is going to get worse. We may be tired of fighting the terrorists, but they're not tired of fighting us. And the next time we have to go in, we're going to have to do it without those Kurdish partners who we just abandoned. Right. There's an example, you know, in Iran, uh, or excuse me, in Iraq, when we, the Iranians uh, said that they were going to fight ISIS when ISIS was coming down uh, through Mosul and threatening Baghdad. Uh, the Iranians were basically ineffective against ISIS, and the Iraqis really needed America to come in and, uh, and stop I mean, that flow of, of ISIS fighters in there. So that's kind of a preview of what could happen in this case. Colonel, Josh, thank you so much to both of you.